One ingredient you will need is aluminum sulfate. Look in the spice section of your local supermarket for alum. Check the ingredients. This one states that it is aluminum sulfate. Here's one that is ammonium aluminum sulfate. You don't want this one. Here's one that I was unable to determine exactly what it is. A good option is simply to make your own aluminum sulfate. The formula for the reaction is shown here and has been normalized to one gram of aluminum. And that will yield about 6.34 grams of aluminum sulfate. I want to make about 25 grams, so I multiply everything by four. Here are the ingredients you'll need. Four grams of aluminum foil, 250 milliliters of water, 24 grams or 93% sulfuric acid. The acid is a little bit in excess. I will explain why later. So the first thing we do is add the acid to the water. I pour the dilute acid solution over the aluminum foil and cover the beaker with a watch glass. The watch glass will slow the evaporation of water as the solution will become heated during the process. This reaction is very slow to start and will require heating to get it moving along. I started the reaction about 20 minutes past 3. Let's see how long it takes to react all of the aluminum. So I check the temperature just to see how it's coming along. Reaction seems to be going slowly at this time. A couple minutes later you can see the hydrogen starting to come off of the aluminum. About 15 minutes in it's boiling, it's going quite vigorously. After about a half hour, I remove the beaker cover and I poke the aluminum down into the acid using a glass stir rod. The reaction has now been going for a little over one hour. Now we are a little past the one and one half hour mark. I give it another stir. Two hours now and the reaction has slowed considerably. I decided to add some water at this point to restore the volume back to the original 250 milliliters. It's now been four hours since I started the process and all of the aluminum has been consumed. I check the pH of the solution to see if it is still acidic. If the solution becomes neutral or basic, some of the aluminum sulfate may hydrolyze with the water and form aluminum hydroxide.
The pH is about 4, which should be fine. I try to clean up the solution first by using an ordinary coffee filter. The solution goes through the filter very quickly, but so does most of the impurities. Next, I try one of my favorite methods to remove stubborn impurities. I place a ball of cotton into the neck of the funnel, then pour the solution through. This time the results are much better, and I proceed to the next step in making potassium alum. Potassium sulfate must be added to the aluminum sulfate to produce potassium aluminum sulfate. Potassium sulfate may be found in most garden centers, but you should clean it up by recrystallization before using it. Here is an example of what I've done. Using the assumption that I have 25 grams of aluminum sulfate in solution, I've weighed out 12.75 grams of potassium sulfate, which is the one-to-one -one molar ratio between potassium and aluminum sulfate. Later, much of the water has been removed, and I have a little under 100 milliliters of solution remaining. I had intended to stop a little sooner, perhaps at 125 or 150 milliliters, but time got away from me, and I overshot the mark a little. So I removed the beaker from the hot plate and set it aside to cool. A little over an hour later, this cooled to room temperature, but no crystals have yet formed. I decide to place the beaker in the refrigerator and let it set overnight to see what happens. The next day, I remove the beaker and try, and to my disappointment, I see that no crystals have formed. Perhaps removing too much water causes this problem because each alum molecule requires 12 water molecules to form a crystal. But that's just speculation. It could also be that there simply was no seed crystal to get the process started. So I warm the solution back up and add some more water to increase the volume. I don't show it in this video, but I did filter the solution again and was able to remove some more impurities. So I set the beaker aside and allow it to cool back to room temperature. This time I see that several large crystals have formed in the bottom of the beaker. I decide to place it back into the refrigerator to try and grow them even larger. After a couple of hours, I check the progress and see that there are indeed larger crystals. So I decant the liquid and save it for later. After a little difficulty, I managed to break apart the crystals and remove them from the beaker. I place them on a paper towel covered with a piece of paper to allow them to dry. So after removing more of the water from the remaining solution, I set it aside to cool. After an hour or so, I see more crystals have formed. So by this time you know the drill.
I want to recover as much product as possible, so I go through the process one more time. This time there is very little solution remaining and it will be discarded. Any remaining impurities should be in this liquid. So after all of the crystals have dried, I've separated out the larger ones from the smaller. I may try and recrystallize the smaller ones later. So I weigh the crystals and compare the theoretical to the actual amount. The calculation shows that I have a 99.4% yield, which seems a little too good to be true. Perhaps the crystals are not completely dry yet. Here are some magnified views of some of the larger crystals.